What is going on, everybody? Welcome in to another edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up here on this gorgeous Monday, October 30th, 2023. As always, I am your humble correspondent, Michael Tanner, coming to you from an undisclosed location here in Dallas, Texas, joined by the executive producer of the show, the purveyor of the show, and the director and publisher of the world's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com, Stuart Turley. My man, how we doing today? Man, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood up here in Bear Country. It's colder than crowd. It is actually really cold here in Dallas. Woke up, was like, ooh, it's shorts weather. But nonetheless, we bring <laughs> you an excellent show. Stu has an awesome menu lined up. First up, GE Onshore Wind to post $1 billion loss in 2023. And, uh, you know, jokes on everybody else. They're set to do it again in 2024. So Stu will dive into uh, an impressive earnings loss there. Um, next up, Europe's wind power goal hits new snag, security. <laughs> you know, you know, the Ukrainian seals have now entered mainland Europe and are taking out renewables. But uh, no, uh, but stool, stool, yeah, from a yacht. Figure out what's going on. Um, one of the big things in the oil and gas business is pipeline security. Um, it's interesting, and it's a very interesting article that stool cover on 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 that in uh, in Europe. Next up, natural gas is about to become a buyer's market? Question mark. Hmm, interesting. And it probably will, considering we actually saw some interesting moves on natural gas later next up or, or on friday next up middle eastern conflicts often lead to high oil prices and recessions we, we like high oil prices we don't like recessions and so Stu will weave in really the latest on what's going on um in the middle east and how that's going to continually affect um oil prices next up and finally in the new segment hostile political attitude towards north sea oil and gas threatens energy security as Stu likes to say there's a pattern throughout today um so he will he will weave all of this in energy security guys is absolutely critical he'll toss it over to me I'll quickly cover what happened in the oil and gas markets um on Friday we did see um natural gas pop um and oil prices pop a little bit towards the end of that trading session um mainly due to the fact that Middle East supplies um, coming out of uh, coming out of the Middle East region seem to actually be taking a little bit of of a hit. Um, I'll quickly then cover rig counts, and we had an article that actually dropped on Thursday, but I was on a long assignment weekend. We've got Crown Qua, uh, Conical Phillips. Weighing bid for Crown Rock, who is the, the parent company of, of, of Crown Quest Operating, which is a large Midland operator. So very interesting Ooh. deal. Well, well, Conoco Phillips has got to make a move now, so we'll quickly opine on that deal. And then we'll let you guys get on out of here and get back to work. But as always, guys, before we start, all of the news and analysis you are about to hear is brought to you by the world's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all of your energy news. Stu and the team do a great job of curating that website to make sure it stays up to speed with everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the ener energy news and the energy business. Um, you can uh, check out the links below in the dashboard if you're or in, 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 in the description if you are interested in, in following along. We've got timestamps. We've got all the links to the articles. Appreciate our team who does an incredible job keeping up with all of that. It's not easy to crank this stuff out. Um, they do a great job so you can see the timestamps, jump ahead, see what's going on with Crown uh, Crown Quest already. Or if you want to jump and figure out about a GE's billion dollar loss, boom, you can do that right now. Um, you can also check us out. You can check out Stu's long form interview, same podcast um, feed that you find this one in. You can also check us out um, on YouTube, which is actually one of the best places um, to support the show right now. Go hit that subscribe button. If I was 17 years old and a YouTuber, I'd scream, smash that like button, but I won't. I will refrain from doing that um, in order to spare you guys. Just go check us out there. Again, Stu and the team do a great job. Um, of curating that. Check us out, dashboard.energynewsbeat.com. It's our minimal viable product for what we're trying to roll out as kind of a data news combo. Um, email us questions at energynewsbeat.com. Hit us up on LinkedIn. That's all I've got, Stu. Where do we want to begin? Hey, let's roll to GE. I'll tell you what, GE is a big, big company. And if a big company can lose a billion, the first story coming around the corner, Michael, GE offshore wind to post 1 billion loss in 2023 and again in 2024. Holy smokes, what's going on? Uh, Culp, uh, let's see here. He is the chief executive officer, Larry Culp, 
says wind uh, offshore wind remains difficult this year uh, with losses <laughs> roughly one billion. Michael, kind of rough is a billion. I don't know about you, but I call that a little more than my visa will handle. So, what were you so going to say? Question is this: His next quote is next year we expect to have similar losses, but substantially yep. improved cash performance. What does that I mean? mean? I'll tell you. I'm. I'm. Uh, if you'll notice, there's a publisher note down at the bottom. It says substantially improved cash performance. I'm verifying it, but it's tied to proposed bailouts. That's of course, of course. That's like you know, not to change subjects here, but but when you say we are experience that right there, I are guy of the week, CEO Larry it, Cole. That's super exactly. Here. Oh, we've got a skim of oil. That's engineered talk for we just drilled a dry hole. It's that's uh, the same. Oh, we got a skim of oil. Define um, a skim. On Newsbeat, we ran about four stories on the bailouts that are happening uh, because if they want to do Biden's offshore wind, they need bailouts. And this was one of the first second order of magnitudes to his investors. <laughs> so, what you know, Colt's comments really, you know, this article goes on to say that these come as offshore wind developers are facing increasing challenges, including supply chain disruptions, rising costs for components, and of course, higher interest rates. And that's going to go ahead and delay a bunch of those projects and push out long-term demand for turbines where GE continues to thrive, um, considering their turbine business. Um, they, they, they did have a few wins, um, according to their news report, but this is what I took out of their uh, their earnings calls to a billion dollar loss on wind farms. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, do, do you remember last year? Um, it wasn't Siemens, but there was another one that lost. I think it was Siemens, uh, lost uh, $1.2 billion on their wind farm manufacturing. <laughs> hey, what's a couple billion of losses between friends? Hey, uh, let's sign up for them to sponsor the podcast. We could really right. turn their corner. Let's, let's go to the keep, next one. Let, let's keep with wind power, but let's go to Europe. Okay, this one has got a twist. Uh, this one is from our buddies over at Reuters, or as we used to say, Reuters. Uh, this is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, Europe's wind power goal hits a new snag, S security. Michael, uh, do you remember when some random guy on Substack brought out the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2? And we found out that he was saying that it, there's even one theory that the Ukraine on a yacht uh, parked it right over the Nord Stream 1 and 2. And we're going, holy smokes, what a bunch of morons. So let me just tee this up. Russia's had some subs going around the whole North Sea, and there is a lot in here. Um, turbines have no barriers or surveillance. The guy interviewed in this article says, we don't, we check out at five o'clock. Okay. What a great job, Michael. These guys are on, on the field. They go out and they work in the field. It's an hour out there by boat. You, you, you know, you do, you turn two screws it's lunchtime. Then you go back and then you got an hour trip back. If you're out by five, th this is great work. Now, there's two quotes conundrum. in here. You have these offshore wind farms, which are in international waters or governmental waters. But the government right. is saying that the, 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 the operators should be in charge of security. But as you said, head of Nystad Wind, co-owned by and operated by Denmark-based Orstad, the world's biggest offshore wind developer. Our technicians go home at 5 p.m., as they should, necessarily. Yeah, exactly. People working 24-7 shifts, but something's got to give you, because they bring up, you know, you're right. If This quote he told Reuters, if the Russians wanted to cause damage, they very easily could. Quote, we right. don't do any monitoring. That's kind of wild to say in a public setting. Isn't that crazy? Now, let me throw this squirrel at you. This is an ugly squirrel that's about to hit this one. L Senator uh, Lindsey Graham said, we need to bomb uh, uh, Iraq's oil production. He said that. So, and that would be in order to do, um, uh, you know, damage to their cash flow. So if you sit back and kind of go, 
we got all these people going after energy security around the world. And if we don't do it, and I don't want us to, believe me, I want this on record. I don't want us taking out Iran's oil. Uh, there's ways of enforcing uh, sanctions, but Iran might, I mean, excuse me, Israel might. So if you take Israel and you take this escalating and then you take, uh, I'm serious, a wind farm, even Hamas can get a thing and take out North Sea. Here's, this here's, is all I, I, disagree, I disagree a little with you. I, I'm going to disagree with you halfway. On the okay. Fact that I'm not sure if the, if the actual physical security, I think Russia and Hamas has have better things to do than go blow up a wind farm. That's, keeping three houses online. What I think Person. is interesting and what this and what this article points out is if you read, if you go about halfway down here, developers like Orstad think governments should take the lead and help provide billions of dollars needed to protect their infrastructure. This is a money grab, Stu. It's it a, is. Hey, we're scared. It's security. While we actually are losing a billion dollars and need to make up for the fact that we're losing billions on offshore wind farms, by you have to now pay for security. I think it's fantastic. That is a fantastic point. And honestly, yeah, I, and, and I, a, I'm going to you I'm, blow up a wind farm. Russia's got better things to do than take their nuclear powered subs and roll them through N Norway's um, um, farms. I don't know. That just seems to be like they've got bigger fish to fry. You've got a fantastic point. And I want to say, well done. Uh, you did good. And honestly, if you want to, if I was putting myself in Putin, I would say, hey, I don't need to blow up a, uh, a wind farm. I just let it die because yeah, it's let them not sustainable. Because they're, they're not making money. So, uh, build more. Putin probably wants more wind farms. Yeah, they're all not building anymore and they can't afford to maintain them. All right. The next story follows along with the other one with energy security in the North Sea. And when we talk about this article, it says hostile political attitude to the North Sea and gas threatens mm -hmm. uh, energy security. So it's not only the wind farms that are sitting ducks out there. And uh, this is going to be, I did not know how much uh, actually is out there in the North Sea. Knew it was a lot, but let's talk about how much may leave. Um Let's come in here, and I am going all the way down in here, and it says the uh, international, the North Sea is the only basin where outlook for surplus of high uh, specification of drilling rigs, meaning other regions more competitive for business with longer work durations and higher rates and offer. Mm -hmm. Once these units leave the UK, increasingly, it is unlikely that they will return. That was in the uh, OE, uh, which is the uh, Energy UK 2023 Annual Economic Report. Let me get you some numbers. Um, it is six wells have started drilling so far this year. At least one more is expected. Shell and one well, uh, Pensacola, which started drilling in late 2022, uh, have recoverable resources of almost 1 million BOE. Um, here's where the problem is. Once these leave, the amount of uh, oil rigs that were funded and in project last year are down 30 to 30 to uh, mm -hmm. or even more they're coming you have down to layer in you have to layer in the political atmosphere that's going on you have to remember you know the yep. conservative party over in the uk is not what we would consider the conservative party is so no. the fact that the conservative party right now still has a de facto 75 percent tax on oil and gas production considering the windfall profits and the that's fact right. that the labor party who's expected to win the next general election only go only you know adds to that fear there's the you know the 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 the, the opposition leader kern starmer has already said he's going to maintain that 75 percent tax on oil and gas production so right you know, 
they're as you mentioned, these rigs when they when they get done with 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 their drilling contracts, they're leaving. They ain't coming back. They mentioned they go down to uh, Australia, South Africa. They're everywhere. That's right. Here's here's some numbers. Um, in, over the last two decades, the UK oil and gas industry has produced fourteen point five billion BOE but only 6.5 BOE in new field developments have been approved. 45% reserves. This means the gap between total recovery and remaining reserves has closed significantly. Uh, the offshore rig count, Michael, 283 producing fields, of which 180 are expected to stop. That's 45% of UK oil. At least 20 fields will stop producing this year. Those numbers are staggering. Well, what? Hey, we were talking about this before the show. Sometimes you got to be careful what you wish for. <laughs> you All got right, what's that next? Right. Let's go to the Middle East. Okay, so the thread between all of this is energy security. And now we're seeing that you're going to have oil and gas because nobody's going to be able to do the, the wind farm. Middle Eastern conflict often leads to high oil prices and recessions. Michael, you're too young to remember the oil embargo by the Saudis a long time ago. Um, I wasn't even I think that was. Were you even before that was born? I, I wasn't even a thought back then. Oh, well. Um, the price shocks of the 70s? How old yep. do you think I am? Uh, that's what I'm saying. I didn't think you were around, my young millennial friend. Um, it's not. Uh, okay. So the oil price cycle, uh, remember, we've talked about Saudi Arabia says they don't need to uh, cut production until $110 uh, a barrel. That was last week. So when you take a look, this is an excellent article going through the num the whole history of example of geopolitical upheavals in the area. And I think we would spend a little too much time, but that article is fabulous. I mean, yeah, it I mean, really explains out. It's bulletproof. Makes yeah, sense. And as, and as oil prices rise, the threat of destabilization from an energy security standpoint only continues to rise and if as Stu mentioned if saudi isn't going to do anything about anything until oil prices get to 110 it very much be could do late i do hate to be doom and gloom there are some things that the u.s might do to impose sanctions on iran but the problem is that's or that that's only going to shoot oil prices up because we know iran has been utilizing the dark fleet to get around all this and uh, uh there are two ways that the biden administration did not um uh do the sanctions so let's go to the next article here is natural gas about to become a buyer's market i i agree and disagree with this article michael the reason that this one is in the thread is because uh our great lng projects around the world u.s is still up there with Qatar, qatar however you want to say it as the leaders in exporting lng the world is going to need LNG and natural gas mm -hmm. from now on. I mean, I can't even think of when we're not going to need it for fertilizer and everything else. Yep. Uh, starting in 2025, an unprecedented surge in LNG projects is set to tip the balance of the markets. It takes three years to even get one in. It takes about four years to to uh, permit so a wave of new export projects is to set to remodel the gas pro uh, markets said faith uh, Burrell, head of the agency he's an idiot so um you know he's the same one that said we were already in uh, peak oil and gas demand so uh, Qatar uh, has about 48 million tons of LNG supply coming online. That is a lot. Qatar is going to outstrip the U.S. as the world's leader. 
yeah, Qatar has really set themselves up to be a player in the LNG space. But it's interesting. They see us going from an undersupply of LNG to an oversupply of LNG because when it says it's a buyer's market, it means you can drive the price down. It means prices are going down, which is good for the consumer. So we love that as a consumer when we see prices going down. Now, the problem is with inflation, the fact that these projects take billions of dollars and years to come online – who knows? You have to have a very specific set of circumstances that play out over a five to 10 year period so that by the time all of this shakes out, it is a buyer's market. Anything that goes wrong, delayed projects, you know, shift in international markets, all of a sudden throws a wrench into that. And then it still becomes what it is now, a seller's market. Here's my little crystal ball. I'm pretending my microphone for our podcast. Uh, ooh, zama, zama, zama. Hey, do you remember when I did the uh, Johnny Carson? The amazing, Kresk, Kresk. amazing. Yeah. Uh, and the question is, um, is this story right? <laughs> no. And the reason is because of energy security. All the other wind farms are not sustainable. People are going to blow up offshore stuff, and LNG is here to stay. So, yeah, and I mean to give our, our friend uh, Javier Blas over at Bloomberg credit, he did, he did and the great. article was saying it won't be cheap. However, the LNG will likely change hands still well above pre-crisis gas levels, and Europe is one or two winters away from it. So don't ditch your scarves, sweaters. <laughs> I'll throw this in and shoes yet and shoes because eating your souls is not necessarily a demon. I mean, it's Ooh. you're actually eating your souls. Remember, we were laughing about that. <laughs> Anything else? I'm done. No, no, I'm tired of flying around the world, dude. Well, well, we'll park it here in the United States, quickly cover what's going on in the oil and gas finance markets. On Friday, we did see markets in the S&P 500 <laughs> drop about a half a percentage point. NASDAQ up about a half a percentage point, though. Um, we did see oil prices trade down all the way um, to $83 before having kind of a late stage afternoon bump, settled at 85 6 um, at 85.54, so that's about a 2.8 percentage point gain set to open here as we record this on Sunday, somewhere around 85.16, so a little bit of a softness drop. Reason why prices were up specifically on Friday was 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 going back around to the geopolitical fallout of what's going on in the Middle East. Um, developments there could lead to some impact of oil supplies. Mainly what they're seeing is that um, the United States military has begun to strike Iranian targets. Now, this is in Syria. Um, but it could very be, you know, it could, it could be interesting as, 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 you know, you know, this, the, the Hamas Hezbollah, uh, dual stage war on Israel from both the North and the South could lead the United States to continue escalating, especially if we're taking, if we're taking, you know, if we're getting fired upon, which it sounds like that's what's happening. You know, I think Phil Flynn over at price, uh, futures group said it best. We're kind of at the mercy of the next headline. And I think that's what we've been seeing today with the price swings. And remember we, so we were up, down, left right north south ended a little up but again all based on that future geopolitical supply look um you know i think this is another good one you'd like to be trading fundamentals but you really can't because you've got to be more worried about what's going to happen in the middle east nobody wants to be short over the weekend and that is true so everybody friday was closing out their short positions which is probably why towards the end of the day you were we were all the way up to a little about 86 dollars. things settled much about 50 cents lower why people were selling so that they're not in a position to have over the weekend news screw them because think about this if all of a sudden i mean if you're short and Hamas gets their gets their hands on a bomb and blows up an oil pipeline. <laughs> I mean, and that, you have no ability to exit that trade. You're in trouble. So that's what he's talking yep. about specifically um, when he means people exiting their trades. Um, looking quickly at last week's, well, I guess let's let's look at let's look at natural gas. We had a nice pop late in the evening, um, more of a technical trade. Natural gas was you know currently trading three dollars and or, or, or three dollars at the beginning of the trading session. All the way up um, as that futures contract rolls over, um, you know, we're up to three dollars and sixty cents currently now trading three dollars and thirty four cents. Again, that's a little bit more um, um, of a contract rollover. Why we saw things go up about 20 cents, um, settle back down now three dollars and forty eight cents. I mean, we're going to see natural gas prices continue to move positively as we move into the winter season where we're continually drawing um, from our um uh, natural gas reserves. We'll, we'll, we'll cover what happens um, uh, later this week on, on some of the natural gas reserves. But, you know, it, 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 
that will always be on a teeter considering both the weather and what happens geopolitically. So we'll, we'll keep watching natural gas prices for you. Um, rig counts we did see come out on Friday as well. We saw an increase of only about one. Again, only an increase of one rig in the United States. Um, that's still a drop um, of 143 from last year. Uh, Canada saw a drop of two rigs. And internationally, we saw a drop of 12. So rig counts continue to not move in the direction you would think they would, considering where prices have been. Um, and, and so it's, 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 a, it's, it's a kind of a theme we will continue to follow here as sort of a long-term major trend. So I think the other story worth covering from a finance perspective is we saw our favorite friends over at Reuters. This actually happened on Thursday. Um, ConocoPhillips ju- um, is considering jumping into the M&A fray. Um, they weigh Crown Rock bid to challenge rivals. That's the name of the article. Um, as you guys know, Crown Rock is a uh, private equity partnership between Lime Rock Partners and Crown Rock, who own jointly Crown Quest Operating. That's Tim Dunn's um, firm over there in Midland, one of kind of the original Midland operators. Great acreage position out there uh, in in northern Midland County. Um, but Conoco Phillips, after seeing she- or BP or excuse me, after seeing Exxon and Chevron go ahead and and, and take out um, their. Um, their respective players, you know, Conoco Phillips thinks it needs to jump into the fray. Remember, they're fresh off um, a Concho acquisition, so they're very familiar mm. with that Midland area. They did that about two and a half years ago. Um, to give you an idea, this this valuation because it's privately held, it's it's a little bit different to kind of talk, figure out what that value is worth. It's going to be somewhere between ten to fifteen billion dollars. And the hard part is <clears> knowing <throat> what the value they're going to get for the puds. Remember. It's pretty easy to figure out what PDP is. Get up all the wells, shoot a forecast, you know, you know, and decline it out. That's not the difficult. The difficult part is what are they paying? How, how many premium locations are going to get thrown into this? Is it 1,000? Is it 4,000? And then how much are they charging per location? It'll be interesting to see how of this all base out, um, how this all plays out. ConocoPhillips, extremely familiar, though, as I mentioned, with the Permian after taking out um, Concho. You know, um, if the producer doesn't mind throwing up the tweet that I, I tweeted a few weeks ago, um, I, too, am actually studying taking over Marathon or Crown Quest, um, and we'll update if uh, I decide to place a bid. That update probably comes right now, Stu. I don't think we'll have the money. I don't think I don't think we can come up with uh, $15 billion. Uh, maybe. So I did find uh, the, the, that tweet was really in a response to two weeks ago. Um, Crown Rock has been in the news. People have been considering purchasing them two weeks ago. Devin was was considering throwing out a bid for them. And it's going to be a little bit too rich for their blood. So I, I like to throw that out there. Yeah, I'm too studying um, taking them over. We'll see if it goes anywhere. We'll see if the we'll see if the study ends up going anywhere. But, uh, um, you know. Know a lot of people that actually work at Crown Quest. Uh, very interesting uh, organization that they run over. They, they run a very lean shop. They run a very young team. Um, and, you know, it really looks like, you know, from Crown Rock's perspective, they are the ones, you know, they are the ones attempting to get people to buy them. They, they've got investment bankers running around out there, um, you know, trying to trying to see what they can do. You know, I, I do think Conoco is going to come in and take them out if only because I feel like there's pressure to make a, to make an acquisition, I think Devin and Marathon are the other two names getting floated out there as potential buyers for Crown Quest. The real question is, you know, Conoco Phillips can add two, three, four million billion dollars on top of this as sugar and not really affect the bottom line. It's gonna it's gonna put somebody like Marathon and Devin in a pinch. And the que- and and with Conoco stock and these recent deals being all stock deals, the question really then becomes whose stock does Lime Rock and Tim Dunn uh, Tim Dunn want? They want Conoco stock. Do they want an integrated uh, oil and gas operator stock? Do they want, you know, Devin? Do they want a little bit more independent shale? I think that's really, considering the two deals that came came out were all stock deals, obviously this one Conoco is going to push for an all stock deal. So the question being, whose stock do these guys prefer? I, I don't know. I'd probably take Conoco at this point, less volatile, maybe not as much upside, but they've given so much into that shale space that they may have more upside relative to their other integrated peers, specifically Exxon, Chevron, you know, BP and Shell. So it'd be interesting to see um, which one they choose. But, I, you know, I, I don't think there's any doubt, Stu, that that Crown Quest is going to sell itself here, especially $90 oil. Tim Dunn, he's already a billionaire. He, he could use a few more, and uh, who knows? Maybe we'll get him uh, on an energy news beat. Maybe, maybe in retirement, we'll get him doing an energy news beat podcast for us. Talk about a retirement well, gig. Oh, yeah. We'd love to. 
Yeah. So uh, what else we got, Stu? That's about all I have. What should people be worried about? Uh, the Fed has uh, got their meetings coming up this week, and uh, we you got to love a good Fed meeting since they don't know how to fix anything since they caused it. Yeah. Well, I, unfortunately, that you know you're <laughs> you're trying to dig out of a hole that's that's too far deep. So. All, all right, right, guys. One other thing. You. One other thing. Uh, COP twenty eight. Um, yes. They have said in Dubai that they are not going to support or host. Uh, the 2020 uh, cop 29 so cop 28 is coming up here pretty quick and people are already bailing on cop 29 well just like the olympics <laughs> do me and you are putting in our bid to host host cop 20 or, oh or sure 31 so they're, in, they're in, still bidding out one so we're we're thinking of trying to host ourselves cop 31 so sign up uh online in bear uh, country energynewsbeat.com slash cop 31 you could sign our uh sign our agreement <laughs> That was good. So, all right, guys. Well, with that, we'll let you get out of here. Start your day. Um, hope it's a Monday. Hope you guys don't have it too long. We know the meetings you're going to be sitting in are going to suck. You can stay strong. The week is short. I actually won't be here. Um, actually, I'll be here this whole week. I'll be out this weekend, um, but that doesn't affect the show. So, flying around the world, guys, just trying to keep the news up to speed. For Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks. Oh, <laughs>